Henry, it's time for your special report. Henry, time for your report. Come here. You are ready, aren't you? We're waiting for your report on the decorator crab. Um, my report is on how the decorator crab got its name. And just how did it? Well, there was this crab who lived down under the waves on the seabed. The seabed's not that comfy. Anyway, it can get boring at the bottom of the sea. That's because all you've got to look at is sand. And seaside rock. And shells. Not shelves. Shells. That's better. But one crab had a really brilliant idea. He thought his home would look better with decorations. Not Christmas decorations. Decorations around the house. But he didn't have a house. No, he lived on the seabed. Where he covered everything in paint. Oh, all sorts of paint. Like oil paints, poster paints, and watercolors. And he painted things all the colors of the rainbow. Though he liked orange best. The other ocean creatures saw his painting and asked him to paint their ocean homes, too. So he made lots of money thanks to his decorations. Not cake <laughs> decorations. He painted walls and ceilings. And he'll paint your house, too, as long as you pay him. So, in case there's any confusion, that's how the decorator crab got his name. Henry, do you really expect us to believe that? Uh... Maybe. Well, that's nonsense, you silly lizard. The real reason it's called the decorator crab is because it decorates or disguises its body with things it finds on the seabed. Hey, is it tickling that sea anemone? Yes, and in just the right place. Tickling makes the anemone release its grip on the rocks, and then the decorator crab gives it a new home on the back of its shell. Not a cheerleader crab, too? Sis boom ba! Sis boom ba! If the crab is attacked, a predator risks being stung by the anemone's tentacles. Are you sure it's not just having a bad hair day? Oh, Henry. Lots of animals suck in air to make themselves look a lot bigger than they really are. Uh, Henry, don't go too far. What do you mean, too far? <coughs> Sometimes it's useful to have an inflated sense of your own importance. Snakes and lizards don't always get along. This snake is only out for an early morning slither, but the tegu lizard takes no chances. With a big hiss, he suddenly blows himself up and gives the snake a real shock. Time to leave as the snake searches for a more bite-sized snack. Hey, what about a tasty toad? Wow! The toad uses the same inflation trick, and the snake thinks it's actually too big to eat. Oh, boiled again! It's time for the snake to pull a trick of its own. What's the trick? The snake is a false cobra. Not nearly as deadly as its poisonous cousin, but it can spread its hood to look larger and more aggressive. Did that scaredy lizard move? Sure showed him. Now, Henry, how about a game of heads and tails? You bet. How do you play? Look at all these pictures. Some are of animal heads and some of tails. You have to guess which. This is too easy, Prof. That's a zebra head and... No, no. Those are just examples. I want you to start with this pine cone skink. A uh, head. Or, or is it the tail? No, it's the head, uh, I think. No, it's the tail. I'm positive. How about something easier, Henry? Aha! Now that looks like an eye, so it must be a head. That's what the owl butterfly wants you to think. 
The big owl's eye markings on each wing help to either scare predators or to make them think that its head is in a different place. I'm confused. Exactly. It's all about confusing the predator. Uh, head on left, tail on right. Wrong. Those are fake eyes on a cichlid's tail. I got it. Tails! Good. The hair streak butterfly rubs its wings together to mimic the movements of its antenna. What an actor. That'd get any hunter in a flap. Hmm, acting, huh? I'm ready for my close-up now. Are you talking to me? I'd be nothing without my fans. <laughs> you like me. You really, really like me, don't you? Typical Henry, acting the fool as usual. Why don't you leave this acting business to the professionals, like the greatest actor of the reptile world, the hog-nosed snake? Okay, I'm not so proud that I can't learn from a real actor. When this creature's frightened, he plays the part of a dangerous rattlesnake. He can even make a rattle sound. But it's no good being a rattlesnake when the threat comes from an indigo snake. They eat rattlesnakes, too. So he gives the performance of his life, acting out a dramatic death scene. If looking dead isn't unappetizing enough, he pumps out a foul death stench to turn the stomach of any predator. It satisfies the audience. The indigo snake doesn't want to eat anything that might be so sick it has convulsions and dies. It might be catching. That's what I call belly up. What an actor! It's a snowy owl. Hey, is it Christmas already? I haven't even decorated the tree. No, snowy conditions can show you what sort of disguises animals use in cold climates. Ah, I get it. The owl has a white coat to make it hard to see in the snow. Yes, but the snowy owl stays white all year round. Other animals change to white coats only when the winter snow falls, like this snowshoe hare. No matter what time of year it is, animals rely on disguises. We've seen spots, stripes, and lookalikes, but in the end, animal disguises are a matter of life and death. So, Henry, I wonder if you've learned anything about camouflage today. Uh, don't get chased by hungry wolves. But if you do, make sure you've got a great disguise. After all, it'd be a howling shame if nature didn't provide animals with the advantages and protection of some amazing disguises. Yes, clever camouflage means that the snowshoe hair is all right. Or do I mean all white?
I hope the variety of disguises we've seen has helped you to pick one, Henry. Like stripes or spots? Spots? Don't talk to me about spots! Anyone could spot me looking like this. Better leave it to those masters of animal disguise. Bye!